University of Gießen and Heidelberg, received his doctorate at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in 1994. Following research uh, uh, stages at the MBL, at the European Bioinformatics Institute in Cambridge, and a brief period in one of the first industry in bioinformatics, the Lyon Biosciences in Heidelberg, he was appointed professor of bioinformatics at the Columbia University in New York in 1998. In, 19, in 2009, likely, uh, we are likely, he accepted to come back to Europe and, accept, and accepted an appointment to the chair of bioinformatics at the TUM University in Munich, where he presently works and has a very well established group. Professor Ross conducts research on bioinformatics and computer-aided biology with the focus on predicting the function and structure of proteins and genes. His particular interest is predicting protein interaction and the effects of changing individual amino acids with the goal of fostering a better understanding of how proteins, genes, and cell work. He also focuses on enabling earlier diagnosis and more effective treatment of illnesses. Presently, his work links artificial intelligence and machine learning to evolution. He is a member of the New York Academy of Sciences and has been president of the Inter International Society for Computational Biology, the most important society in bioinformatics in the world, from 2007 till 2014. He, is, he has authored some 200 and 80 scientific publication with an, an extraordinary Hirsch index of over 80. So welcome back to Bologna, although virtually, dear Burkhardt, it's a pleasure to have you with us this afternoon. Thank the you mic very, is yours. Thank you very much, Rita, Gigi, and everybody else. And thank you for being here. Thanks for joining this talk. Thanks for organizing that meeting. It's a pleasure. The 23rd. Um, and I am sort of trying for the first time to give it with an iPad. I've done that before. If it goes wrong, I'm sorry. Put it on, on, on Apple or my... Thanks, Rita, for organizing this winter school and Gigi. An amazing thing. So this is, this is one of the earlier ones. You may see some of the participants. And thanks also to David. By the way, this is David in the background standing here uh, with David Baker and uh, Michael Levitt, who then got a Nobel Prize, and um, okay. The background. Let's begin with the data story, and let's put put it to begin with data, in a way in which I, as an old man, as a dinosaur in this field, see the data. So when you look closer, you see where most of you started bioinformatics. This slide ends, and nevertheless gives this message that the data explodes in bioinformatics, and not only the data explodes, but much more of the raw sequence data here, uh, which is now over 225 million sequences that we know. And in fact, if we sort of looked at BFD, uh, then it's 2.2 billion, right? So the number of sequences we know is even much, much, much larger. And compared to that is down here, the number of proteins for which we know the three dimension structure or the number of proteins for which we have some annotations. And I, another way of illustrating that uh, is a project that we did recently. And it's a project of uh, a student in my lab, Maria Littmann, and now she is doctorate. Um, and ultimately my question to you is, how many new experimental annotations in terms of number of proteins have there been added since November 2019? So the background really is Maria, for her PhD to, uh, study, worked on binding predictions. So any part of the protein for which we know that it binds small molecules, not other proteins, but DNA, RNA, small molecules, metals, and all kinds of these things, right? She had developed a method, she had collected a data set, and now she wanted the latest data over the last two years that have been added. We're not talking about human, we're talking about any possible organism, right? And we are looking at anything for which we have uh, a PDB structure and biolib. So essentially two years of adding experimental annotations. I'm not sure whether you guys can use the chat. Can somebody sort of speculate how much was added in two years? 
of binding residue annotations. Number of proteins, again, is, is what I'm looking for, right? Not asking how many residues, uh, but in two years, for how many proteins have annotations for binding been added? What do you believe? Can somebody just shout a number at me or unmute or put it into the chat? I see the chat. Maybe the chat is blocked, I don't know. 1,000, uh, someone suggests that it goes. There it's 1,000, it's, it's, a, it's a very good suggestion. So the number is 1,592, but the relevant number here is 14, it's 46. I'm sorry, I could not tweak this to be 42. Uh, pretty close to 42. So 46 of these proteins are what we can really use for our prediction method. Okay, this is two years of experiment for any organism, organism out there. And this is just sort of, again, in the same time, the number of sequences grew by 100 million. Uh, this is bringing home again, the difference between the number this this growth that you see here, in an even more in some sense, extreme way, because that's the data we can use for deep learning. And you can almost all sort of already guess that deep learning with an additional 46, this is not a lot. Uh, I'm going to talk about it later. Now, the other point that I want to make is that artificial intelligence AI is completely changing paradigms and algorithms. Uh, and let's go one step back. In 1996, there was a game of chess played by the chess champion, then, then chess champion Gary Kasparov, playing against a computer. Deep Blue, it was called from IBM. In 96, Gary Kasparov lost. Uh, one, sorry, one, 42, the computer lost. One year later, the computer won, all right? Gary Kasparov 2.5 wins and the computer 3.5. So one was a draw, right? Um, what had happened in between? Why did the computer win in 97 and not 96? So the answer is not that Gary Kasparov had too much tea or something like that. Any idea? The algorithm is, that's the funny thing, uh, Michele. Uh, uh, the, the algorithms did not get better, no. What got better is just the machine got bigger. Okay, the, uh, the big blue was suddenly a bigger blue. And what the machine essentially had done uh, historically at that point is that the machine was just good at solving problems brute force. Bigger machine meant we could compute a few more steps back. And I'm sorry for, for, for the light, I didn't close the blinds well enough, um, but I hope it'll, it'll be better in a moment. Um, so essentially a bigger computer means you can compute two or three or four moves more back by simply trying all possible moves, right? And that historically is the way we think about computers. They are big, dumb machines that really try every possible move. And they get bigger, they try more. They're not getting more intelligent. So I really like Michele's point of, of, of better algorithms. Historically, that is actually not the way we do it. Although, of course, algorithms is something that is sort of behind computer science. That's how it started. And I just want to make this point that Ada King is uh, shown here, uh, is one of the first people who actually developed algorithms. It was a woman. I, I feel, feel this is an important point to once in a while make. Um, so then we got, we for, fast forward to 2016. So roughly 20 years later, after Big Blue, uh, or 19 years after Big Blue won, uh, and we have a new game, or a different game, not chess, but Go. Uh, and Go is in fact so much more complicated that a computer cannot really t try brute force all solutions. Nevertheless, in 2016, Go won. And the way it won is through a machine from a sort of subset of Google called DeepMind. And many of you know DeepMind from AlphaFold 2. That's exactly where it comes from. Uh, and that was one of the first big pushes of this company, DeepMind, here, uh, where they use it to, in fact, win Go through artificial intelligence through, in fact, that is exactly what Michele said, through better algorithms, or what uh, David and all the others who, Maria, uh, making this point of more data. Yes, that's the combination of better algorithms with more data and bigger machines, 
in AI, in a package of AI. That's where the paradigm changes. Now, for the first time, we have computers that are no longer these big machines that do dumb things, but they do something clever. They do, indeed, artificial intelligence. It's not just a word. Uh, it changes the paradigm. And I see now, sitting in the computer science department, that, in fact, many people work on finding solutions for problems that have been solved, for which we have clear solutions, and they put AI in. Not because they can, but because AI leads, needs less energy. So we find solutions through AI because they are cheaper, cheaper environmental. Uh, I'm thinking about environment or for, for uh, in autonomous flights of quadcopters. Cheaper really is because they are lighter and they actually can compute much more and can fly much more autonomous. Um, OK, let's get back to another story. The story of evolution teaches protein prediction. And that essentially is sort of the story of most of my career. And essentially it's been ending over the last year through AI. So when we think about protein function and protein structure, it comes on many levels. There's no clear definition of, of, clear definition of function. There is a clear definition of structure. But function is many, many, many things. Uh, we can define function on the very chemical point here where we say how the atom is bound. We can go to the biochemical level or at the end of the day, we can go to the genetic level. And all of this here is function. Which one you find is more relevant to you depends on your focus, on the focus of your work. Uh, one way in which we can sort of define that function is anything that happens to or through a protein. In our group, our focus is on molecular function. We are predicting effects of uh, sequence variants. We are predicting where a protein is, what it binds to, and when the binding happens. And we essentially still do some aspects of protein structure prediction as long as they help to predict function. That's our background. That's the group. Uh, as all the other groups over the last two years uh, sitting in Zoom meetings rather than physical meetings. It's the same, we just talked that, about that before. Uh, most of it is Zoom. Anyway, let's go back to the idea behind. Uh, the goal of protein prediction essentially goes back to an experiment for which Christian, An Christian Anfinsen got a Nobel Prize in which he could show so that goes back to Epstein and Anfinsen in 61, in which he could show that you take a protein sequence, you throw it into a solvent, it adopts a unique three-dimensional structure. Since the protein can do that, that means all the information for how the protein looks, for its 3D structure and its function, is written in the sequence. So ultimately, if the protein can do that, if the protein is intelligent enough to fold, why can we not do that in a computer, right? And that ultimately gets back to Rita made this point that I studied physics at some point. Uh, physicists think about landscapes, or energy landscapes. And there is one particular energy landscape that I show here. In this energy landscape, you see this ball uh, at some time point, And you see now the remarkable reality of this landscape is that you can easily predict where the ball is going to end up. The ball is going to roll to this minimum, then it's sort of going back and forth a little bit, and then it's going to be in a stable condition somewhere here. And you can predict that from that point of beginning, and even if you did not had not known the initial conditions very well. So if you had believed the ball is here, but in reality it was here or here, the outcome is the same, right? And that is a relatively simple problem. Now imagine a problem of an energy landscape like this one here. So in this particular case, you immediately see that if you make a tiny mistake in your initial condition, you get the answer completely wrong, whether it goes here or there. So you assume that the ball is here, but in reality it was here, and you believe it would go here, but in reality it goes here. So you're entirely wrong. Now, in some sense, the cleverness of physicists is to call this type of problem chaos and say, we don't handle that. What we do handle is this one here. All the problems we handle in physics are the easy ones. Uh, and in some sense, that's an intelligent way of reacting to, to reality. Now, let's go about this story for biology. In biology, essentially, what we see is there's a point mutation that can change the structure. Binding to a substrate or to another protein can change protein structure. Any environmental change, pH value, or DNA next to it can change structure. So, that means now suddenly that in order to predict structure, you would have to need the knowledge of the history of the entire molecule to predict. 
And that is nonsense, right? This is like the butterfly effect kind of story. You, we cannot do that. Now, but nevertheless, this kind of problem here is the problem that we face in biology, right? How come we can nevertheless try to do that? And the answer to that is evolution. How is that? What I'm showing here is the number of residues aligned for a pair of proteins versus the percentage sequence identity. So I'm asking, I have two proteins that I align, that I compare. Um, over, say, 100 residue, I ask how many residues are identical, and I say, for instance, 30, more than 33 of these are identical. That means they are in this blue realm here. The blue realm means all the proteins that naturally evolved in the blue realm have essentially the same three-dimensional structure. Down here in this region, we don't know. Some of those have the same structure, but we can't tell. But if you have two proteins that have 33 out of 100 residues identical, they have a similar structure. Okay, fair enough. Now, if I went to the lab and I took a protein of 100 residues and I exchanged five of them, I claim most likely I would sort of influence structure. And that gets us to this question, wait a minute, you say that you change in 100 only five here and you mess it up, but you're still absolutely in the blue realm, in the, in the blue region. How come I can change the structure? How come in, in nature what I see is 67 can be changed and I can only change five in the lab? What's the answer to that question? Well, one possible answer, of course, is I'm really, really bad at changing. I'm really, really dumb. And that certainly is part of the answer. But there's more to it. How come nature can change 67 and I cannot change 10? Selection, exactly, Maria. That's exactly what it is. Uh, thank you for, for being active. So selection essentially means one what we see here is an unlikely event, but we nevertheless see the unlikely event because that is selected. And it is selected because only proteins that continue to function will survive. Or the organism, of course, is selected on the level of the organism. Uh, so it's a bit simplif simplification to, to talk about the level of survival of a protein. But ultimately what we see is a selection mechanism. That also implies now that when I ask which amino acids are the 67 here that can change, then the answer to that question would contain a lot of information about structure. In that exchange pattern, there is important information. So if we think about this sort of one way of thinking about it, and that is uh, the SH3 protein is a large protein family, and I'm showing, so two, these are two different sides of the same molecule. And sorry for the animation, this, this really went wrong. Um, and what you see here is this is that residue column. Uh, the columns that I show in purple are the ones that are essentially conserved, meaning for this entire diverse family, it essentially has a similar residue. Not qu it's not quite the same amino acid if you can look at the details, but it's roughly conserved. Okay, And there are four roughly conserved columns in this protein. And the one, the rightmost one and the leftmost one happen to be close in three-dimensional space. And that implies that if I cut out a window of five consecutive residues, these five that you see in black here, in this window of five consecutive residues, you see a signal of something that happened elsewhere. Because whatever happens at this point here is influenced what, what is happening at this point. But these two points are connected in sequence space. They are relatively far away. Put differently, in a cutout window of five, you see something of the environment far away. This is like this analogy of the raindrop in which you see the world. This world is the world of a protein. This world is the world of the constraints under which the protein operates. But you have that in this profile, in, in this cutout profile. So, how can we get it out of there? In principle, so one way of thinking about that is you convert this problem into that problem by essentially averaging over different organisms, right? So these organisms create, sort of allow you to move from the chaotic problem into a, well, in a, into a solvable problem. And that's the idea of using evolutionary information. You can use that sort of thing as input to predict, for instance, secondary structure. And I'll get back to that in a minute and to other things. 
Um, in many ways, I'd argue, artificial intelligence is the understanding of the 21st century. Uh, by the way, historically, we have always talked about machine learning. Uh, now I use sort of mostly in, uh, artificial intelligence. It is, I, I will confuse these two terms in my, in my talk. There is this underlying idea um, that artificial intelligence is sort of a black box. Okay, it's black magic. It is something that does something and I don't know what it does. This is total nonsense. If you have anybody talk about it in this way, then that is a person who doesn't understand this story of artificial intelligence. It's not a black box. You can open the black box. You can actually look at the rules. The problem is you don't understand the rules. Why is it that you don't understand the rules? Because AI is applied to problems that are so complex that simply we cannot put them into simple rules, right? It's not the problem of AI. It's the problem of the problem we solve with AI that makes it so complex, right? These rules are not simple. And that is something that we have to clearly understand. Now, in order for AI to extract knowledge, truth, we need to go through some protocols. The first protocol is referred to as cross-validation. And it's way more complicated than what I'm actually telling you today. Uh, in this world, we essentially have a pi here representing the, all the experimental data. So 100% here is all the experimental data I have. And I split it into part that I call the training set and part that I call the testing set. And the testing set I hide under the table. I pretend I don't have that. I develop my machine only using this training set. And then later I sort of get this set under the table out and say, let's see how well it generalized. Okay, this is not all I have to do. In fact, I have to have four different data sets of test sets, and they have to be such that every part of the training set here, or of the, of the experimental set of data set that I have, has to be used exactly once. Not 1.5 or not whatever, exactly once, right? That's important, and it's a complicated story. But that's not all. Actually, two data sets are not enough. We need three data sets. We need a training set, as what you could call a cross-training set, or validation set, and a test set. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you in a moment why we need uh, these three. Uh, and that is also not enough because we cannot just split this set here randomly. In, in the way we split it, we have to remember that there are some relations between proteins. So we have to split according to families. We have to split such that if you have some set of proteins that are somehow sequence similar, for that are such that if for one you know the structure, you know the structure for all of them, a homology-based inference, then they cannot be in two different data sets. They have to be in one circle. So that makes the classification a little bit more complicated. And that's still not enough. You need sort of a pre-release set. And that's the story I showed you in the beginning, a pre-release data set. So you have worked on your method for n months or n years. And in the time it took you to work on that, new data was revealed. And that's the pre-release data. Your method has never seen that. You have never seen that. And you, that is new method, uh, new data that is orthogonal. Or it's not in the same family. And then you apply your method and see whether your test set gives the same result as this pre-release data. And that is still not always uh, enough. But essentially, you can sort of, in a, in a simplified way, say physics is a penitio, biology is the novel. So you can only learn rules essentially from, from facts that you have. It's very important, however, to understand and know your AI and to know your data. And it's not as, as simple as it sounds. Um, and actually, you have to have data at the first place. So if, for instance, that were the amount of data, you have 50 data points, you cannot do deep learning with it. You can hardly do AI with it. And that, again, is what, something that is happening more and more often. So with a breakthrough of AI, increasingly also do nonsense by having tiny data sets with millions of free parameters not working. OK, let's have a detour of something that I call machine learning the old style. And I still feel it's important, in particular in, this, in, a, in a winter school, to sort of go through what was and what will be or is and understand what the difference is. For that, I use as a test case or as, as an example here, secondary structure prediction. Secondary structure, so there are different secondary structure states. Uh, there's a program that takes the 3D structure, assigns hydrogen bonds, uses hydrogen bonds to so assign secondary structure. And the major 
two animals are helices, uh, ele elements are helices uh, here in red, the rods and the beta strands, if they come together, referred to as the sheet. So essentially in this universe, I have three states. I have the H, I have what is the extended structure, the E, and I have something that you could call O other. Okay, three states. Now that means I sort of want to have a prediction method that takes my sequence and classifies it to three different states. Uh, very early on, and I'm not sure, uh, here, here's the entire thing uh, with, the, with the citation, I'm sorry for that. Kapschen Zander, after they developed the DSP method, they looked at uh, continuously running stretches and saw some stretches of sequence are always in helix, some are always in strand, some are always in a loop, and then there are sort of pentapeptides here that in some proteins are observed in the strand and in others in a helix. How can that be? How can I explain that? I have the same sequence that adopts two different structures. So once it's adopting this rod kind of thing, a helix, and sometimes it's adopting this strand. How can that be? These students. Yes, so the uh, interaction is absolutely right. Uh, um, so the both both answers are right here, folding uh, interaction. So ultimately, the point is that whether this is now a strand or a helix, or whether it's red or blue, depends on what is left and right. Depends on what's the environment of that sequence. That could either influence the folding, these interactions could change the way it folds, or it could even, if it folded the same way, in the end suddenly sort of flip in a different way through the interactions it has. So that means that, in fact, we already know we cannot do secondary structure prediction uh, for five consecutive re residues. And Piero and, and Rita, uh, and maybe Gigi was involved in that, so there was another uh, paper that looked at much longer stretches that cannot be uh, clearly more than 11 residues that cannot clearly be distinguished. Um, so that's a problem, but clearly we have helices, we have we have strands, um, and we want to sort of predict uh, secondary structure. The idea is we use neural networks here, neural networks, essentially there's an input layer, there's an output layer. In the simplest version, I have only input and output. Uh, the units here have, have simple unit uh, values, say one, or it could be zero. There's a connection from the input to the output. I simply take this value, I multiply it with this connection. I do the same here, multiply it with that connection, and the input to to this green unit here is simply the sum over the j i j's times the the if I call the input unit the o uh, i's, then I do j i j times o j right. It's a simple sum over that. Uh, and that ultimately is like a vector multiplication. Then in my next step in this unit here, in this simple unit, I have sort of a trigger function, a sigmoid function. I simply say, if the sum is very, very highly positive, I switch it to one. If it is very, very highly negative, I switch it to zero, right? That's the entire idea of, of a neural network. And with this sort of approach, what I can do is I can classify points, for instance, here, the open and the dark circles, and I can classify that shown here through lines. So the vector multiplication essentially introduces a line in space, and the four lines that I show on the left, they all do the job equally well. They, everything left of the any of these lines is, is black, everything right of it is, is white. Uh, open. And now when you look at the example on the right, you immediately see there is no simple line that does it. Okay, you could have a curved line. That's one way in which you can do that. Or you could have a double line. You could say whatever is between these lines or outside of these lines. But in my neural network, in, in order to introduce new lines, so double line, we need a new layer. Um, essentially, now you blow up this layer here, so you add hidden units and you make it more complicated. So you go from lines to uh, hyper parabolas or hi hyper space. Um, anyway, so the 
the computation of the device is still exactly the same as it was before, right? That's the input here, that's the output, and there's some, this is called hidden, because essentially the signal that is done in here is just computation. What you see is the output, what you put in is the input. And the computation is very simple. Now, in order to train that device, essentially what you do is you have sort of an error function with respect to the connections, and in this landscape, you simply go downhill. Uh, you, this example is chosen such that you could sort of find a local minimum. You escape downhill, essentially is shown in this gradient here. Uh, and to avoid local minimum, you allow uphill moves. That's all. That's the entire thing underlying any kind of neural network. It's totally trivial. Uh, in this neural network, you train over time. That's the training time. And you get sort of a an accuracy 100 means in this particular case completely right and i see two points here and i have some something that i call overtraining so what are these two curves that may be too trivial for you guys um, so if the this is another way of, of measuring how ai is changing uh, five, six years ago, I would have to explain neural networks. Now people know deep learning, so you are all way, way ahead of that. Uh, so this is overtraining. Essentially, what I'm showing here is a training set. What I'm showing in blue is the cross-training testing validation set. There are different words for that. Uh, but we talked about that already, and that's essentially exactly this idea of uh, cross-validation. That's the entire pie is the all available information. You have training, you have testing. And that is the point that I said before. Two sets are not uh, enough. Why is that the case? Say you had a method one and a method two. Method one has 50 hidden units, method two has 25 hidden units. And for secondary structure prediction, on the test set, you get 62 and 65%. Can anybody of the students comment on what I have? So which method would you pick? Or shout at me, what is wrong in what I'm doing? Can anybody shout at me? So what I'm putting in front of you is something that you should never do. Why? There are many things in here that you should never do. You should always have error estimates. Uh, you should always show what random is. You should always show what is the, I call it ceiling. So how, how what's the agreement between experimental so between two different measurements and things like that. Uh, but that's not what I mean. What I mean here, the real problem is this one. I should never use the test set to make a choice because what I'm sort of inducing you to say is take M2, the second model, with 25 hidden units because 65 is higher than 62. That's what I'm trying to put in your mouth or in, into your shed and nobody is sort of taking the bait. Uh, so thank you that you didn't respond in some sense. You did it all right. You all knew this is absolutely not what you should do. This cannot be the test set. This, in fact, and I'm sorry, is what we need the third set for here. What I put in here has to be on, you may call it validation set. Again, different communities give that a different name. Some communities call that validation set. Some call it uh, test set and the other one. So the, I tend to refer to it as cross-training simply to give the idea that you're still sort of using it for development. And you use that data set to set hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are, for instance, the question, how many hidden units do I use? What architecture in my deep learning network do I use? Do I use a neural network or do you use an SVM or a random forest or what else? The test set here in blue, that's the set that you use at the end after you do all the development and you decided, no matter what, I'm going to use M2. Then you use the test set to estimate performance. Relatively, how well you do, what is the best model, is all part of hyperparameters you do on another data set. That's why you need three. What I showed you before in this sort of situation is in fact not right. Uh, typically, the reality of testing looks more like this one here. So that's a real training cycle of secondary structure prediction, where the training set, as you see here, is, is going rapidly toward 
is not quite 100, but rapidly close toward 100, while the test here is standing below. And again, I'm saying you should never do that. Instead, you should use this validation set here. And then you should decide whatever the value is that you stop. Here is my early stopping criterion. Uh, I do the stopping, but I do that on this data set and not on that data set. And again, so we always see in textbook these kind of problems. In reality, the problem is more like that. And in this reality problem here, what you see, there is no clear point. So you may argue that this risks less overfitting than that point. This point is possibly a little bit lower than that point. But on the other hand, the difference here between training and testing is much higher here. And that may indicate that there is more likely overfitting. Uh, anyway, reality is more complicated than, than toy problems. And that is sort of the first example um, where things get complicated. So how do we do that secondary structure prediction now? Uh, the first question is, where do we get a data set from? And the data set that we have, I said there is DSSP. So let's just assume that this is uh, by my, my data set here um, of all the known proteins. Okay. Can I use all the known proteins for which I, in fact, here say that is from the PDB? So for all of these, I have known uh, secondary structure. I use that entire set here for training. Is that right? Or put it differently, uh, that is wrong. Why is it wrong? Why can I not use all my data? Some parts should be separated. That is very true. Uh, so, okay, fully taken. So I do the split uh, and I'm sorry. So I have these pre-made slides because I'm not good at drawing. Um, so now I have training. I have, let me call it validation and let me call it tests. Is that it? Are you now satisfied? And then I have to rotate and do all of what I just told you. But can I take all the data? So again, DSSP comes from the PDB, the protein data bank. That is where all the protein structures are deposited. At this point, I'm not completely up to date, but it's in the ballpark of 150,000 uh, structures in there. Can I take them all? The data can be redundant. That's the point where I want to come. Uh, so say that is the experimental data. In fact, I have to create a non-redundant data set. Why is data in biology redundant? Can you throw some explanations at me? There are many reasons, actually. Can you throw some at me? Why is biological data redundant? Why could it be? So why is it actually that I have to look at that? Well, let me give you an extreme example why that is the case. So if I took the entire PDB and I asked for how many of the PDB we have pairs in there that have 99% sequence identity. Uh, Andrea, I'm, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. Uh, thank you for answering. Just, just give a sec. So all I'm trying to say is that if I now exclude from the PDB everything, if I create a subset from the PDB that is such that no pair has more than 99% sequence identity, that is almost half. So almost half of the PDB is melting away because those are things above 99%. And they will focus. This is it's not that for every protein I have two in there. It is for some proteins I have many, many, many more than two. And my method would sort of zoom into exactly those proteins. Um, and in fact, Andrea gave one important answer. We have, in fact, often examples where we have uh, an X-ray crystallography answer in there and an NMR structure of the same protein. So we have two repetitions of the same protein just to show that two different experiments give the same answer. Or we have the situation where you have two different groups doing it in competition with one another. And one is a little bit faster and publishes in the higher journal and one is a little bit slower and publishes in a, in a, in a lower journal. The other way of thinking about it is 
one studies the protein bound and the other one studies the protein unbound. Those two proteins are 100% sequence identical and they're different forms, different shapes, and they're both relevant for understanding the biology. That's another example. Another, I, can somebody think about other reasons why there would be a duplication? Why would you do a similar structure again? Yes, that's very true what Maria writes. I'm not sure whether you all see the chat, but uh, the chimp and, and human, for example, are very similar. But let's let's look at something a little bit more further away than a chimp, a mouse. Uh, so many proteins between mouse and human, if you look at them, and I'm going to show you later in my talk a few examples, um, different ligands and different inhibitors to another is, is a very good explanation. It is true. Um, but the parallax orthologs again myoglobin hemoglobin they are pretty far apart uh, uh apoproteins yes you guys i believe I, I should stop it you're all right all of these are true but the point that i still wanted to get to is uh, something that i would almost call a little bit social uh, so say it is much easier to do a protein in a bacterium than to do it in human okay to get the structure for e coli is much easier than for humans so if there is a protein that is similar between e coli and human i would always do the structure first in e coli uh, with the e coli protein and then once i have the e coli protein and i want to sort of understand the human mechanism i still will try to get the human protein too so that's one reason and it's yet another reason uh, it's sort of implicit in some of what what you guys wrote and said and there's the other social thing if i do the second one it's easier than the first one and I, maybe I get a lower structure, a lower publication, but I still get a publication. It's much easier to get the publication. And we have a lot of that too. Duplication because of human competition or because of, of, ease, of, of, of getting structures. Anyway, all of that is something that I have to get rid of. And we have to remember that when we apply our machine learning method that we develop on that data set, where we threw away something, we try to model this data set. We try to model the data of the future. Those data could be different. We don't know to which extent this set here is representative of that set. We always assume when we begin with the data set today that to some extent the future data set, the whole world out there, is reflected in what we have today. And we have to find ways to find out at the end of the project whether that in fact is true or not. Um, and sometimes that works and sometimes that's a little bit tricky. So I see that I I take more time than I thought for 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 this, um, but so the simplest method essentially I take the known structure I find the longest consecutive runs of a motif, for instance helix or strand or other, and I simply take that to predict signal structure and that is essentially a simple signal structure method. There are slightly more complicated ones that use Shaw Fassmann or Gore. They use statistics. They simply ask the probability of a particular amino acid, is it higher in H, E, or other state? Uh, this one is the GOR3, is a generation of methods that does the same, but now instead of saying what's the probability for an individual residue, it asks if this individual residue is in, in a uh, neighborhood of uh, five others, left five left and five right, what's the probability? And with that, you get to sort of 60% Q3, so correctly predicted, the number of residues correctly predicted in either of the three states Helix, Strand, Other. Um, and there are several problems with those methods. In, in fact, secondary structure prediction was a field where the first method was published by Shent Gergi in 57 in, in Science. Uh, and between 57 and 92, somehow, methods were limited to numbers around 60%. And the argument was, uh, for years, you can never reach 65% because in these local windows that you're looking at, you don't have all the information. That's like those five mirrors, remember? You need to get more of the, the, the sequence environment before you get to 100%. And the argument was, we're hitting our head at 65 because that's all you can do with local information. And then the next observation was that strands are predicted at, at levels of 40% identity, 40% uh, accuracy and that is because strands are even more local why is that so when we look at an alpha helix the hydrogen bond forming pattern is done between i residue i and i plus four so if you have a window of of seven consecutive residues i and i plus four is in there so in seven consecutive residues you always see this and the hydrogen bond forming partner 
In fact, if you, you just go to 15, you have both partners in there. While when you look at a strand, the connection, the hydrogen bonds between two different strands, you see the strand here is, uh, is zooming this way, then it's going back over there. So in terms of its binding partner is a strand that is very, very, this strand is very far away in sequence from that strand. So if you look at the sequence neighborhood of uh, 11 consecutive, you do not see the hydrogen bonding partner in there. In that sense, this is less local than that. That was the argument why you predict beta strands so poorly. And then there was an argument that uh, the predicted secondary structure was too short. An example here, that's the observed secondary structure in this column here. And here's a bit, you see short, if they are too short, you, in each one of these cases, you don't know, is this now an E or is that should I sort of swip, swap this E here against an H? Should I swap these two E's here against an H? Or should I swap the H against an E? Same thing here. So to short means not really useful. Um, and then the idea simply was uh, when several groups started that, including the Rita in Bologna, can we not put neural networks to solve that problem AI, the first elements of AI to do a better job? In order to do that, what we have to do is we have to take a stretch of sequence, here's 13 consecutive amino acids running from the D to the K in this particular protein. And each one of these here is essentially 20 amino acids, 20 units, right? Um, and then I'm going to predict H, E, L. So I have three output states. That's the way I do that. Now, what, what you actually see here is not 20, but 21. Uh, in those days, what we we, we, we call that a, a spacer unit. Today in DL, you call it padding. So essentially this is because if this, what we are predicting here is the secondary structure for the central unit here in this particular case is a P. Um, by the way, in brackets, you see the secondary structure in which it is. Uh, I use the symbol L for other, E for extended and H for helix here. So you see the center pro line here is in an extended is a strand. Um, so essentially, if you want to have the D, say D would have been the first residue in your protein, and you wanted to predict the secondary structure for the center residue D, that would mean, so this is a window of 13 consecutive, so six before the D are empty units, are non-amino acids, right? And that's what you use the spacer unit for. This is just what you do in today's world of deep learning. You call it spacer unit, right? Anyway, so that's the simple network. And what we got out from the simple network is 62%, which essentially is the same as every other method that existed before. Um, so just assuming that you use AI, and this is a comment that Rita made before I started, uh, just assuming that, that a new algorithm, a new AI does the job, didn't work in this particular case, right? Um, now, I'm sorry, the, this, this animation didn't work. What I'm showing here is the time of training, and here I'm showing performance. What, I'm, what you see is the training for strand in blue, the training for helix in red, and the training for the state other in green. What do you observe? Can somebody see what, what sort of is... The blue is the lowest performance. Correct, Katya. Uh, in fact, it's very low. The other thing that you observe here is that when you go to essentially the first time step, at the first time step, the system already has learned helices and other, right? It has not learned at all strand. In fact, it does way better in strand. Uh, more training does not improve the performance very much. That is very correct, Camellia. But, however, more training very much improves the performance of strand. In fact, it appears as if the network over time is not doing anything other than learning strand. So helix and other, those two states alternate. They fight with each other. The system is not learning anything better here. 
Sometimes the red is above the green and sometimes the green is above the red. It doesn't learn that. It only learns blue. So we actually have misused our classifier into, do, into doing only one thing, learn strand. How come? Well, let's look at something in a different view. In a different view, when I ask 100% here, the pi is all correctly predicted amino acids. That fraction of it is helix, that fraction of it is strand, and that fraction is other. Now what you see immediately is the white is predicted best, that's the highest fraction. The blue is predicted the worst, that's the lowest fraction. Okay, now I look at something else. I look at the performance, the, the fraction of these three states in the database. And you see they look very similar, right? That is my performance of the network. That is the proportion at which I have those three states in the database. And they look alike. Actually, I could argue what I want is a method that predicts all three states equally well. So what if I changed my distribution in the database? What if I, rather than took this database, I sort of tweaked the database to contain one sample of each class? And I can actually do that by changing the training dynamics. When I do that, then this is what you get. So suddenly, all three classes are trained equally well. The system does not make a difference between beta strand and alpha helix. It predicts exactly the same proportion for all three. The downside is, since the database contains most of what it has is O, and since now all three classes are predicted equally well, the three state performance is dropping from 62 to 60 because I'm doing less well on the majority state and I'm doing better on the minority state, which overall reduces my performance, but it gets equal performance. Now, this is an example that I find interesting because by sort of understanding what the AI does, you can completely influence what it actually achieves. And not only that, all textbooks today still say that prediction methods predict strands less accurately because they are less local. And it's a very sound explanation, but it's total nonsense. We can tune a system. Not all explanations that, are, that make sense are right. We can tune the system as shown here into predicting all three states exactly equally, although beta strands are less local. Doesn't matter. What really matters for the, for the device is the way it is presented in the database. Here's the next problem, um, and I believe I'm going to sort of quickly go over that problem. Uh, predictions are so, too short. In order to change that problem, I need to stack up neural networks, and this is we, we, we need to create something that looks like sort of modern uh, deep learning methods, and that's still not enough. Then you learn that in order to put more information into it, you use evolutionary information. You instead of uh, using 21 units where 19 are zero or 20 are zero and one is one here, like the pro line in the middle. Uh, you now have probabilities, the probabilities you get from a family of aligned proteins. You put that in, you build this whole system. You put all kinds of additional information into the system. You use insertions, you deduce deletions, you use conservation weights. You use something that has to do with the length of the protein. You use the amino acid composition. When you move your window through the protein, you keep track of where the window with respect to your protein is and all of that. And then you combine many models and you get to the best met methods uh, in the time and you get sort of some distribution that then was 72% roughly. There's always some distribution. Uh, so that's secondary structure prediction and the secondary structure prediction of the olden days. And then you have to sort of, again, I have to see um, that you in fact make sure that your data set is representative of the universe. Um, and I believe we are now at the point where I want to talk about the modern days. Uh, and I believe talking about the modern days, and I took this time to talk about the olden days, uh, because for some problems, this is still valid. For most publications that you see today with machine learning, they still use expert crafted features. I call it the olden days because in the next hour, I'm going to present something else to you. 
But undoubtedly, everything that has been published until, until 2019 uh, or 2020, uh, many things that are published today, are what I would call the olden days. People decide what they use as input and they have enough expertise to make a clever decision. And if they are clever enough, then they get a good, mess a good system. So this system that I show here has been developed over a course of several years. And there's a lot of expertise that went into what exactly you put into the input. But that is no longer the situation. I, Gigi, you said something about a break. Is this the moment where we should have a sort of a five minute break or, as or not? As you prefer. It's totally on your decision. Whenever that you feel. is a very bad situation because I feel like the one who's the sir. I'm. I feel. I see myself as a public servant, um, meaning I give the talk because you guys listen. Uh, I do it for you guys. Um, it's, okay, you're good. It seems that it is the right moment because now we are turning to what's going on nowadays, huh? Modeling. So we're gonna have a five-minute break. And yeah, gonna, why not? We are okay. gonna we are gonna talk again in five minutes. Um, good. It's enough for you for a coffee. F f I I don't count. I I'm I'm ready for anything. Um, okay. This is for <laughs> you guys. Offer you a but coffee. but this is. Uh, I also said that I would take I would sort of continue on this part of the PLMs, the protein language models uh, after an hour and that. Is okay. not quite over, so let's just just we we'll reconvene at at uh, four o five. Okay, okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. If anybody wants anything, I I, I stay online. Okay, so again, I repeat what I have talked so far about uh, the typical ways of crafting input features for machine learning devices. I say in the past, but the present is really just starting. And it starts with what we call the modeling of life, PLMS, protein language models, PLMS, uh, PLMs. Uh, and the people, so this is work, oops, somehow I, this is work that was highly influenced by, initially by Ahmed uh, Naga and Michael Heinzinger. Um, let me begin with a few concepts of, oh God, it's, sorry. Don't check my, my uh, system crashed. Okay, let's begin with a, con a few concepts and thanks a lot for, to, to Christian and Michael and Chris uh, for many things. So let's begin with the idea of natural language processing. So the idea of when we are going back in time again, 30 years ago, the way people try to put natural language into computers is by putting into machine learning devices all kinds of rules. The modern way of NLP is to do that imminently, to essentially learn grammar from the data. And that is a project that actually has come, become fruitless only over the last less than five, fewer than five years. So the input in my system here is all uh, the words all science is. And that is put through a set of devices. Uh, the system I show here is for embeddings from language modeling, ELMO, so-called ELMO, um, and so published in 2018. So by now, this is outdated. And again, in less than four years in this world, you get outdated. Uh, but again, the idea simply is you are with a bunch of deep learning, stacked deep learning devices. You're essentially learning the words to see the words and in fact, predict, ammo predicts what is in that context here, What's the most likely next word? It ranks in a table uh, the probability of the most likely next word. In this particular case, the most likely next word is all signs is communication. Uh, again, I'm really happy for everybody to switch on the camera, but please switch off your microphones. 
Um, so that's the idea for natural language processing. Now we take this idea and simply translate that to proteins. And the way we translate that to proteins is the first jump is that we have to sort of find the equivalent meaning. And the equivalent meaning, we equivalent, the equivalence that we are creating is a word is an amino acid. In the language, in the regular language, the word is the role of the amino acid of the protein. And the sentence, the role of the sentence in our world of proteins is essentially the protein sequence. The entire protein sequence, we could sort of model domains. And this is, again, something that some people have been begun to do. Uh, there are all kinds of other approaches. I'm going to stick today to the simplest way of doing it. And the simplest way of doing it, word is amino acid. Sentence is the protein sequence. In comes this part of the sequence, the first four letters, and out is supposed to come the next one, this part of it, right? And that's what this device in here learns to produce the next amino acid. Um, then there is sort of the same thing done in a transformer style. In the transformer style, you're not predicting the next one, but essentially you're sort of graying out, you're masking out uh, particular amino acids and you're trying to sort of find them back here through the context okay so essentially what that means is and then I'm going to talk about this word embeddings embeddings essentially are the raw units the last layer in a stack of uh, deep learning networks the last layer of hidden units embeddings are just those numbers Ultimately, all of this stack here of deep learning, they learn the grammar because they learn to sort of reproduce the tokens here, amino acids, from the context, from the sequence left and right. Okay. And in this particular case shown here, this is the level of embeddings uh, and the level of embeddings. So the embeddings that we use in our lab, in fact, exactly are 1024 numbers. Now, that means that what I'm creating here is a device that as input has sequence and as output it has sequence. Put it differently. I put something in, I get something out. In fact, that something that I get out is the same thing. In between, I have a black box. Now, in order to make that black box run, what I'm putting in here is uh, essentially BFD. So this is 2.2 billion sequences. So for those of you used to Uniprot, that's 10 times larger. Uh, and it is not more redundant. And in order to do that, I sort of have all the machines in my lab run for half a year. Or the moment we get to the transformer style, I only can do that with a Google account. Uh, so that's supercomputing work for a long period of time. What's the gain? So I get the same I get the same out that I put in and I sort of waste a lot of money. Why? Well, um, the point essentially is I want to learn representations. And that is sort of the story that I told you before uh, for secondary structure where we sort of go from uh, sparse coding into using evolutionary information, into stacking devices, into using other type of information uh, in order to get better. And in but that is what I said is completely outdated now. As of last year, we are completely changing that. As of last year, we use these transformers. And what these transformers create are the hidden layers, are in fact what we call embeddings. That is the part that contains the secret ingredient to go further. That is what you call transfer learning. So I learned from the unannotated 2.4 billion sequences, I learned the grammar of protein sequences, the grammar in which protein sequences are written. I learned what sequences are possible. What if I have an E at one particular position? What is most likely next to it? That's what I learned. What if the E comes with an EQ, EQ uh, repetition such as this? What's the probability that the next one is W? 
those terms I learned. And those terms, in fact, are extracted from the last layer of the hidden units. That is essentially the thing that I showed you here, right? That contains all the learned language, all the learned grammar, that contains all the knowledge that has been extracted from BFD, the 2.4 billion sequences. And that I now use as input to predicting, for instance, secondary structure, solvent accessibility, disorder, uh, inter-residue distances, localization, and other features. And I'm going to talk about each one of those in a minute. Um, again, embeddings are the last two layers of hidden layers. In our case, we use essentially the last two. So we get 512 from one, 512 from the other. Uh, and that gets me 1,024 units. Now I have two different scenarios. In one scenario, I have for every single amino acid, for every single position in the protein, for every every residue in the protein, I have one vector. So in this example that I show, instead of 1024 here, I'm showing four, okay? So for every residue here, I have a vector of four components. For the S, for the E, blah, 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 right? Uh, that means now, if I want to do anything to predict the V, I can use those four as input. Okay, if I want to predict something for an entire protein, so that one I would use if I wanted to predict that this Q here is in, in a particular secondary structure state. If I wanted to predict something about the protein, for instance, I wanted to predict that protein binds DNA, not DNA is, well, here's no DNA binding site in this sequence, uh, but say this, this, this would be a slightly, slightly different sequence. Uh, or something like that, um, then maybe that would be the DNA binding site. So this could be the, the this could be a strand. Um, so if I wanted to predict strand, I would essentially use that as an input. If I want to predict a particular code number or that the entire protein binds DNA, then I have to average. And the way I do essentially, I take every single one of these four units, so 1,024 in our case, uh, and do an average over the entire protein. Okay? So now, at the end of the day, in my example here, I represent that entire protein with four numbers. Just like I present every single residue here with four numbers. That's the per residue prediction, that's the per protein prediction. Is that clear? So I could do that, by the way, uh, one of the big issues with this AI field is it is developing so quickly and it developing so quickly uses its own language uh, and the communication is getting extremely complicated. So in the language of the people who actually advance machine learning or AI, this is called pooling. The per residue for protein cases per token. Uh, but the idea is that clear to everybody. Or is there somebody who wants to speak up and ask a question or pause? If not, then I assume that you get the idea of how embeddings are created from unannotated protein sequences. Unannotated means none of those I know the secondary structure or the location or whatever for, or the binding for. Uh, this set of embeddings is an expression is an extraction of the grammar of protein sequences that's what i call learning the language of life because that contains everything that forms sequences and then i can use that to sort of do all kinds of things the first thing is this one here so i'm looking at three different views the first one here is a clustering of the different types of amino acids. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. Uh, maybe that is making it a little bit easier to see. Uh, so here you see the 20 amino acids on the left. Here you see the classification of different types of structures, um, stru structural classes. So all alpha is in blue here, for instance, all beta is in green here, for instance. Uh, alpha, beta, alpha slash beta, membrane proteins, uh, and the cell safest proteins. So you see some uh, split. And then here's the, on the very right, you see the tree of life, where the red ones are archaea, viruses are here, eukaryotes are here, and bacteria are the green ones. 
Okay, so my question to you obviously is, do you see some clustering? What I'm putting in here essentially is the something that is a, at 1024 dimensions and then I cluster. I cluster so that the coloring, I cluster, sorry, I, I cluster first and then I put the colors in. My question to you, do you see some grouping? Do you see something that makes sense? Does anybody see something that makes sense? Does anybody step forward and say that is total nonsense? That is absolutely random. Nobody steps forward. Uh, I lost the audience. Did they all come back from the coffee break? Uh, the coffee, um, the Swedes call it fika. Uh, there was too much cake in the fika. Um, so my point why I'm presenting this is essentially what you see is nothing. What you see is a high dimensional space suggesting something happens. And this is the kind of thing you see in almost every talk of AI these days. And people look at classifications that somehow make sense. This one here is random. It's deliberately random to somehow induce in you this feeling that you see something. And just to tell you, if you cluster 1024 dimensions, it is so easy to fool people at oneself. So most people who present that don't try to fool you. They fool themselves first and they believe they see something. Uh, and once they have seen it, they want to share it with you. That's why they show you those, those photos with you. Um, so the first one here is random. Uh, sorry, I'm, I lost my... Where is that? Uh, yeah. So all of these here are random. These are the real classifications. So here I would argue now you begin to see things. Uh, but the point why I'm showing you the random first is just to make you a little bit more cautious when you see these T-SNE plots, uh, UMAP or whatever, uh, those types of maps. It is very easy to suggest some clustering, although it's not there. In this particular case, it's deliberately not there because we randomized. It's just something, uh, clusters, uh, when you take 1000 dimensions and you project them down to two, there's a lot of sense that is created by random uh, things. Again, this is all nonsense, right? Uh, but, you know, going back to the lower part here, arguably, uh, that is where you begin to sort of see. So you, for instance, see the positively charged amino acids. You see the negative charges grouped together. You see the functional amino acids. You see something that has to do with hydrophobicity. You see some outlier amino acids that play particular roles. You see the small amino acids. You see things that do really make sense. And the same is true for, for structural domains. You even see the same here uh, for eukaryotes. And you see also viruses that are split between two different organism types or different, different types of viruses. Now, however, in order to really get uh, into understanding what we actually see, we have to count. And uh, what, we are gonna, what I'm going to begin with is per protein cases. So where I essentially pool over the entire protein sequence, where I average my 1024 dimensions of all amino acids or all residues in a protein, and then I get the protein to be represented by 1024 dimensions. Um, when we look, I talked about that before, when we look at different proteins here, in green you see the KRAS from human, then there's the rash from human, in lime here, is, here's an example for the rash, um, then there's the fly here, and then there's a hydroxylase example in purple, here's an example for that. And you see that although the purple and the original uh, green here, they are in fact only 90% se 19% sequence identical. Essentially, those two still have the same three dimension structure, right? So you can change a lot. And this is essentially the idea behind homology based uh, inference. So you find two proteins that are sequenced similar enough, and then you simply take whatever you observe for protein one and you annotate protein two with that particular label, right? Now, the problem of preparing data sets in machine learning or AI is that very often 
machines really zoom into exactly doing something like that. They do homology-based inference. That's why we always have to compare to homology-based inference. And it's also true that the vast majority of annotations that you have in today's database, in fact, are not really experimental annotations, although they are typically labeled that way. They are typically computational predictions. And clearly, most computational predictions are homology-based inference. Um, but now, again, I'm going to show you what you can do with embeddings on that level. And here is the first idea you, that comes from Maria Littmann and Michael Heinzinger. Uh, you use embeddings here instead of sequence similarity. So for homology-based inference, what you simply do is you say that two proteins are similar to each other when they have similar sequences. Now we simply replace sequences by the embeddings. So we replace the sequence vector by an embedding vector and look at the similarity in the embedding space. And then we find proteins with a known Go annotation, and we simply say that my query protein has the same Go number as the one that has the most similar embedding vector. A method that does exactly that at the CAFA competition was not the best at all. So the best methods are all here, and they're clearly better. That's where we are. So the best methods are clearly better than that. But our method is incredibly fast because this is essentially a lookup of, of milliseconds on your telephone. Uh, and you can essentially run human in, on your phone in less time than it takes you to finish a typical telephone conversation. And you can literally do that on that phone, right? Uh, so that's the advantage of it. It is not the best thing, but it's incredibly fast, and it provides an alternative. Because it provides a means of, in fact, comparing proteins not at all by their sequence, but by their embeddings. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember I told you in comes sequence, out comes sequence, and the thing that learned in between? The thing that learned in between learned the grammar. It learned, I call it grammar, but it also learned the context in which you see certain sequences. So by having an annotation similar or an embedding similarity, you essentially sort of uh, abstract a sequence to a higher dimensional space in which the similarity between two proteins, two embedding similarities, tell you something more than just the sequence similarity. And that is ultimately the signal that works. Here's one example. Here's another example that comes from Konstantin Schütze, uh, where we see that, in fact, doing the same thing to sort of find proteins better, better means more to the right, blue is uh, the the embedding space thing, that's MM62, that's the fastest sequence alignment methods that you that you have at the moment. And at sort of a similar level of performance, it gets a little bit more. This is not huge, but it is amazing for such a simple step. Um, now here we show an example in a collaboration with Christine Orengo, Nicola Bordin, where essentially we predict fun fams. Fun fams, so that goes back to the CARTH, uh, method Christine Orengo and Janet Thornton put forward, in which they essentially cluster the universe of all protein structures into folds and related super families. And then they cluster families into families, and then they cluster families into fun fams. Fun fams are the subsets of protein pairs that have similar structure and similar function. And these clusters you can again identify using embedding similarity. The annotation transfer, I call it EAT, uh, on the level of sequence. Again, extremely fast, uh, extremely successful. Um, now, here's an example where, again, the second, and I'm sorry that things get a little bit uh, confused here because I'm just not used to, to using the iPad. Um, so, again, this is the raw data. This is random, and you see that raw data and random is not really that different. But then you see the trained method. The trained method here uh, is from Michael Heinzinger. Uh, he calls it ProTucker. Now, what ProTucker does, in fact, that is contrastive learning. That's a new method in AI. In order to do that, essentially what you do is you describe two proteins again by these embeddings, and the embeddings that we put as input uh, we call is, is a transformer, we call them PROT-T5. Uh, we use these PROT-T5 embeddings. And then essentially what we do is we learn in CAF classes, in CAF families, 
uh, through the hierarchy of, of Ka, we will learn when two proteins are similar, when two proteins are dissimilar. So at each learning step, and that's the part of contrast of learning, we take a pair that is in the same class, and we take another one that is in a different class. So it, the ones that are in different classes are pushed further apart, and the ones that are in the same class are put closer. Iteratively, this method then learns a new level of embeddings. So again, what is what you see here is based on just comparison of 1024 vectors. Protucker then is simply a new set of embeddings of 1024 derived from these older levels of embeddings. The contrastive learning has essentially made this new level of, of um, embeddings here much better at classifying class classes. So left, you have 1024 embedding vector. Right, you have 1024 embedding vector. The way you change them is you learned through contrastive learning, you learned the cath. And you could do that for anything else. Uh, in this particular case, um, that has just been submitted. This is in revision at this point. It's a relatively simple idea, a relatively simple method. It just shows you one of the many things you can do with these embeddings uh, at a level that is incredibly successful. I just want to point out uh, Aquaria that has been developed by Sean O'Donoghue and uh, Andrea Schafferhans. And uh, Aquaria, if you like protein structure, is a wonderful interface to visualizing and modeling protein structures. Um, described in Nature Method here a while ago. They have just wonderful images. Just look at this one and the whole mo modeling interf uh, uh, interface is wonderful. Uh, but then Sean used Aquaria and applied it to co to the entire SARS-2 SARS-CoV-2 SARS -CoV uh, genome. And in going beyond just Spike-2, Spike-2 is just one of many proteins here. And by looking at the entire genome, this could show how mimicry and hijacking and many other features uh, in the proteome are, are relevant. And this is sort of, again, mapped back here to the structures. This has nothing to do with the embeddings. This is just one example where this similarity or this molecular observations of hijacking mimicry was discovered by finding a protein that is related, that is analogous uh, to a non-spike. This includes spike here, but it goes way, way beyond the spike, the structural view of the uh, SARS-2. But to, in fact, find these relations is absolutely crucial to understanding the biology. And these finding of the relations, that is exactly what this protucker here does. That is why I brought that story in. Um, so. Let me look at pro per protein prediction. So we are still staying in the realm of per protein. But so far, what I essentially talked about are what I would call a homology based inference, or I call it E tier, embedding uh, based inference, essentially, annotation transfer, embedding annotation transfer. So I look at two proteins at their embeddings and say when they are similar, I sort of take the embeddings from one to the other. Now I'm going to talk about using the embeddings to develop a machine learning device. So far, what I showed you is not machine learning based, except for that the embeddings essentially are created by machine learning devices. Um, here is the first example where I sort of uh, have a sketch of a eukaryotic cell. I want to, for instance, predict uh, whether a protein is nuclear, cytoplasmic, extracellular, or some levels in between. And typically, historically, the way to do that best is by using evolutionary information. Uh, this is for the data set uh, that's a 10 state. Uh, accuracy here. This is sort of a naive prediction. That's an alignment based prediction. And that is a prediction that never uses alignments, only embeddings. So again, now we have a machine that has learned on a data set, has optimized so input are only embeddings, put into some deep learning device. In that deep learning device, the connections are optimized such that from those embeddings, I can predict. Again, input here never is an alignment. The alignment, again, I repeat, is the most crucial input part if you want to predict with, without embeddings. And you see that this number here is substantially higher than that number. That's one example. Um, I'm going to go over that. Uh, I just wanted to point one thing out here from Valerie. 
uh, so essentially what Ma uh, Valérie did is she took the predictions of the entire proteum and each one of these here is the proteome prediction, the, 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 we call it the frequency, the location spectrum. So for each of the, in this particular case, we boil it down to a vector of seven different types of localizations. And we are essentially showing that 10% are predicted in this and so what, and that gives you different, as you see here, one, two, three, or how many, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different organisms. For 10 different organisms, you have slightly 10 different coloring or vectors and now what we do is we take these as input to a simple 2d map in this 2d map you see that on the one end here you have the the yeast types uh, you have mouse rat uh, homo sapiens here next to gorilla chimp uh, here c elegans here are the insects so what i'm saying is by just putting in a vector of predicted subset localization, you see some evolutionary signal. There's much more to it. It's a much longer story. Uh, I only wanted to sort of give a quick idea that a prediction of location on the level of the proteome can be extremely useful. And now we can do it with these embeddings even better and even faster. That's the other thing. They are not only better here, they are way, way, way faster than those because essentially these vectors are created in, in something like in the, in the ballpark of minutes. Uh, or less than minutes. Okay, um, now let's look at a few examples where I do the per residue prediction. So here I have average of the entire protein. Now I'm actually going to put in the 1024 dimensional vector for each amino acid or for each residue in a protein. And I'm going to have per residue predictions. And again, I do uh, transfer learning. So again, I use the embeddings as input. Uh, the first example here is secondary structure prediction. I take that simply because it's one of those very, very strong competed things. Uh, one of the best methods that is available is uh, NetSurf P. Uh, as you see, that reaches a Q3 of around about 84%. And here is where you get with embeddings without alignments, right? Uh, and that, again, is not optimized in the sense uh, so the, lo the prediction for local localization that I showed you is not straightforward. So there is some, I'm not talking about as a light tension mechanism. It's sort of a little bit more clever uh, than what I show here. What I show here essentially is a, is a device that uh, the naming has only to do with the underlying protein language model. And the only thing that distinguishes these here from one another, that by the way, is the Facebook model but other than for this particular example here, is, is doing very, very well, by the way. Uh, but for this particular example, this, this turned out to be better. But the underlying prediction method is totally trivial in this particular case. Uh, and already a relatively, our objective had never been to really predict secondary structure. It was just a simple way to sort of measure how well this performs. Uh, before I showed you the TSNI, now I get to the level of, is it more meaningful in a different level? And, Clearly, we can do better than using ali um, um, uh, sequence alignments. Now, you would expect that methods that use sequence alignments essentially do better uh, for larger families. So larger families are here, smaller families are here. Um, that is the one that uses alignment here in blue. And you see that for smaller families, the embedding based method is slightly higher uh so this is higher than that in some sense for larger families they are more or less similar and for some families in fact the alignment method is sort of better uh, now here's a different f f a different view this is a view so in some sense this is a is a, is a um, this is a graph that pains me because there's an immense amount of money that went to producing it uh, and it is sort of a thing that is more relevant for people who are more involved in deep learning. So what I show is the performance. It doesn't matter. Here I show Q3 as in secondary structure prediction. But we played the same thing for other ways of looking at it. Here is the number of samples that you used in order to train your device. That is not the size of your database. What I'm actually showing here is how long did you train that device? And ultimately what you see in this curve 
is the longer you train, the better it gets. Now, this training is not the training to predict secondary structure, but what you see here are different language models. So this is how long you train the device that extracts the protein language model. Okay, uh, on the right, you see language models that took much more uh, time to train than those on the left. And ultimately what you see here is there's a clear correlation in terms of performance for the task that you do the, the transfer learning to. Again, in this particular case, it happens to be secondary structure, but it's completely irrelevant. I'm using secondary structure as a proxy for how good is my PLM learning the grammar of the language of the sequence. And since it's going up, that tells me that it's learning more in that direction. And it's learning more by ultimately simply training more. Now, this is an absolutely trivial finding. The problem is, what you see actually down here are the biggest language models that we have. So we can just not go further up with those because we don't have the, the compute time. I have to say, these are transformers. These can only be trained uh, on hardware from Google. This is not hardware that you can buy. This is hardware that you can only uh, rent or get cloud accounts for, get grants for. And again, I repeat that to produce these is immense amount of money. We could just, we just don't have the muscle to put these somewhere up here and then see whether then if we sort of took this one and trained twice as long, would that also have a higher performance? It looks as if we just can't check. Uh, so again, what we see is the longer we train these PLMs, the protein language models, the better for subsequent transfer learning tasks, such as here, signal structure. Let me talk about 2D or 3D structure prediction. So now we use the same thing, and that's work from Konstantin Weissenow, uh, who uses the embeddings, but now a slightly different way of using embeddings. So he also, there's another aspect of transformer models. They're not only putting out these embeddings, as I said before, as I showed you before, they're also putting out something that is called attention heads. Attention head, essentially, when you look at a particular amino acid in the protein, it asks how much do other, all the other amino acids in the protein, all the other residues, how much did they contribute to that particular position to be, uh, you put yourself onto position 42 and you ask what the rest of the pro how is the rest of the protein influencing 42 and that is a set of 700 numbers and he uses sort of the top 100 to save energy and uses those top 100 along with the embeddings to predict protein distance maps and here this is compared that's the method from Konstantin for two targets from the cast competition and that's a method that sort of did well for many casts in a row called Raptor X. Um, for some proteins, we do slightly better here. For some others, uh, no, here's where we do better. Uh, well, no, for both of those, we do better. But there are others for which Raptor X does better. Um, so we, we, we showed, I showed you here only two where, where ours does better. Uh, but ultimately, it's sort of a similar performance. Raptor uses multiple sequence alignments and the method from Constantine doesn't. Since the method from Constantine doesn't use multiple sequence alignments, it is sort of more protein specific, while Raptor and Alpha Fold 2 are more protein family averaged. So now what we can do is, and we did the same for Alpha Fold 2, but unfortunately I don't have, uh, I didn't put those, so those slides in. So for this particular membrane protein here, I show predictions for four single point mutants. And for the four single point mutants, you see that the structures look different and the structures that are experimentally determined are captured much better actually by Constantine's method than in this particular case by alpha 4 2 It's not that this method, I have to make that very clear, it performs somehow on the level of Raptor X. Raptor X is a method that performed somehow on the level of alpha fold. Alpha fold, or slightly worse, or, or somehow worse. Alpha fold 2 is a completely different ball game. 
but it's way more accurate. So the method that I'm showing here is way less accurate than AlphaFold 2. But it is all also way faster. Uh, and way faster means we can it is we, we can actually tackle issues, and I'm sorry, I don't have the slide in here. We can tackle issues such as seeing amino acid variations. So when you sort of, we, we, we just did that over the weekend. Um, so with AlphaFold 2, if you want to predict the effect of a sequence variation of a SAF, uh, I should have put these, these figures in uh, immediately since I see you. I wanted to put them in, but Obviously, I didn't. Uh, so, for uh, a few proteins, we essentially did 20, 25,000, 26,000 predictions with AlphaFold 2 of variance and compared that to experimental DMS values and compared that to this method. And that method, in fact, captures a better correlation to DMS than AlphaFold 2. I repeat, AlphaFold 2 is way more accurate to predict 3D structures than this method based on embeddings. But the method on embeddings doesn't use alignments because it doesn't use alignments. It is much more sensitive to single amino acid changes because AlphaFold 2 is an average of a family. Um, anyway, we can use that to predict binding residues. And in this particular case, the idea of transfer learning is so much more important because of that issue that I talked about, the 46 new proteins that have been added over the last two years. So overall, the number of proteins that we can use for training is extremely small. So here, essentially, we have an example where instead using embeddings as input makes a difference of day and night. The method that Maria published initially in proteins a few years ago, in fact, could only use uh, machine learning on a single amino acid. We could only use eight input units. Nothing else was supported by the data. The maximal we could do was eight input units. Uh, and eight input units just does not give you enough space for a window. It allows you to essentially put in only one input unit. Uh, but now with embeddings or a way to tune embeddings right, uh, this, this is doable. And with this, she can predict uh, ligand binding. So the ligands she looks at is metal ions, nucleic acid, small molecules, or here's L, any, any ligand, and then she gets an F2 in the ballpark of 0.5. Uh, that may strike you as low, but it's actually impressive. And one example uh, for how impressive that is, we could look at the one, the subset of amino acids for which the prediction is much better. The precision is sort of reaching levels of 80 or 70% or is what I'm going to look at. And when I look at the 70% uh, prediction in this particular case here, you see the blue ones are binding residues annotated and the red ones are incorrect predictions. Um, looking at this, you see that the red ones are not incorrect predictions. The, in fact, incorrect, highly reliable incorrect predictions, they are seemingly incorrect. It's just lack of observations. The predictions are correct. So when we, when we talk here about 70%, the real number is much, most likely much larger, larger, because for whatever we looked at, whenever we had a reliability of this type here, uh, then we saw things that most likely they were in fact not annotated. We can now use this uh, essentially in a machine that you have under your desk. You can run the entire human genome uh, uh, over less than a weekend and can, up, can come up, uh, this is experimental annotations. This is sort of what you can put in by doing homology-based inference. And this, for 90% of the human genome, you have some annotations of binding predictions with this thing. And for some substantial number, you have, in fact, new binding annotations that are not visible in any other method, only embedding-based, uh, putting embeddings into uh, a machine learning device. Now we can actually use embeddings and predict evolutionary conservation. So input is embedding, output is essentially CONSEC, a method from Nirbental shown here, um, Nirbental's method CONSEC. And you see that a relatively similar linear regression gets relatively close to the standard of truth. Uh, which is essentially a psi blast based uh, method that con predicts the conservation. Uh, we can use that as input to predict the effect of sequence variance. Um, 
and with relatively simply amino acid uh, uh, linear regression devices, a little bit more than linear regression. That's work from Celine, Michael, and Tobias. Mostly, uh, we can predict uh, SAF effects better than methods that use, again, multiple sequence alignments. All the embeddings are available. That's uh, the method bio embeddings, so you can download them from Christian and, and Constantine, and they put out all the embeddings that I talked about, plus others from, from other groups. Um, I am sort of running out of time. I still sort of want to make a few points without showing the data, so I'm going to uh, swish through slides very quickly now. Some of you may have heard of the salvage gene. When we essentially look at the uh, variants in the human genome, we have a lot of evidence molecularly that, in fact, there's an altruistic proteome. So the variance between us, between people, apparently have an effect that is deleterious for the individual, but they are built into our proteomes simply so because we survive as a species. For me, I like this story because ultimately it's a story about from the molecular biology, we are able to make our environment survive. We are able to work together. We just have to discover our own molecular biology. And with that, I'm going to zoom through, through the slides. Um, and in zooming, I lost, um, I'm sorry for that. I'm, I want to sort of fast forward to some other part. Um, ultimately, our genetic differences matter. Uh, the collaboration is written in our proteome. There's another part of the story that is the story of bias. The story of bias is something that is increasingly becoming important in society at large. Uh, we see many examples for that. Um, and again, is a story that I that came to me from Christian de Lago uh, is something that is very dear to me. And the important message here, again, I cannot really go through the slides, but the important message at the end of the day is that this is something from computational biology, we learn to handle bias. Uh, and we sort of, if we can do that better, then we should find a better a better way to sort of get to the public at large and, in fact, make our abilities visible to other people. Science is communication. And that's what I want to sort of get to the final point here. First of all, we all have to make methods available. And again, thanks very much to your people, to, to the people in Bologna who organized this for making their methods available. Uh, so this is pretty protein here which is a method that is now online since 29 years, was in fact the first internet server in protein structure prediction, uh, protein sequence analysis, uh, went from, from the EMBL in Heidelberg to Columbia University. Sorry? No, I called an interference. Okay. Um, I'm, I did not get time. If it is important, I, I just ignore it. Uh, um, um, the other point that I want to make, interdisciplinary research is great, computational biology intrinsically. Uh, but here the question is, can we prove this? Uh, Gigi, is there an announcement from you? Sorry? Is there an announcement from you? No, no. OK, I'm wrapping up anyway. Um, so we had. This is sort of my first method, uh, first message here. Uh, we had a meeting that essentially was only uh, a meeting. Most of that was walking and talking and doing science and walking. That walking was in the Alps. And you sort of see the, the group going up the mountain, come and at the end of the day, reaching the top of the mountain. Um, that is, in fact, one of those castles from, from, from Ludwig, another one. Um, but, you know, collaborations typically are tough. They, may, they are fun, uh, but they're not easy. So let's just, can we measure the effect of collaborations? And that is work from Maria Littmann and Katharina Zelik um, that was published in Nature Machine Intelligence uh, two years ago. Um, and ultimately what it showed is, first of all, interdisciplinary work has higher quality. So what we're showing here is three different uh, scales and I'm always comparing whether in light green 
uh, or let's let's begin in dark green we have a computational biologist in lighter green we have an experimentalist in lightest green we have both experimentalist and uh, and then I'm asking what's the percentage of papers published um, where we for instance have computational evaluation methods and you see that is much higher for using when when computer scientists are part of it than if they, when experimentalists are part of it here is an experimental proof there the way is the other way around if you have a computational scientist only then there are very few experimental proofs if you have an experimentalist only there are way more right here again that's both uh, no evaluation method this one is highest for no evaluation method here's a similar story for data available program available comparison with other method and ultimately the, the message here is whenever you want to publish science that in fact is more likely to survive time you have to collaborate that's the message here now comes the next message uh, so i would call that higher quality um, but here i actually have an impact factor per year an annual impact factor uh, that's experimentalist alone that's computational biologists alone and that's both so seen from the computational biologists collaboration helps because this one is lower than that one seen from the perspective of an experimentalist is the other way around you lose by putting a computational biologist on your team you get a lower impact factor and that is just a reality of the situation right and this is just interdisciplinary research in fact brings higher quality but higher quality is not necessarily reflected in citation index teach for fun and to enjoy is ultimately the message and that message started with something that guy did guy had a great idea to do computational biology he wanted to do a course that does javascript data mining and machine learning and he thought he's going to get many people into the room if what he does is he offers a course in computational biology and what happened actually is that it completely failed and ultimately the point is that in this one semester course the computer scientists never really got through the complexity of the data and it was a very frustrating experience for them uh, because at the end of the day they never understood the data and they never learned javascript they never learned data mining and they never learned machine learning because they were just frustrated and that got guy to doing something much simpler so his idea then was what else could i do in, in in order to sort of get a large crowd but do something where the data is easy to understand uh, that thing got him to a tedx talk and that ultimately was uh, Game of Thrones. And essentially, initially, what they, what he, what he did was, uh, who will die in the uh, next season of Game of Thrones? And the method came out before that next season was sorted. Again, AI predicted, and then the later version of the same thing essentially had the odds to survive for the final season of Game of Thrones. Now that had a tremendous visibility. It was sort of both of those were read by over a billion people or visible to a billion people. That's the second part here. And it was a lot of fun for the students and it was a fun for, for everybody else. Um, clearly, about the last 20 something or 30 years, the marriage of artificial intelligence and evolutionary information was the breakthrough. It started uh, 92 or something like that. Uh, and it ultimately ended up in AlphaFold 2. That's sort of the pinnacle. That's sort of the big breakthrough. AlphaFold 2 clearly largely solved the protein structure prediction problem. And so now, so there's a method called Collab Fold from Martin Steinegger was essentially take, uh, simplified AlphaFold 2, taking uh, the AlphaFold from DeepMind, Google's DeepMind, uh, taken from them and that runs on our machines in just a few minutes per protein so when I said we did an alpha fold 2 run for 25,000 sequences this is the kind of thing that you can do essentially uh, in a relatively short period of time that's an amazing breakthrough and alpha fold 2 I talked about our method is embedding space based and has some advantages certainly one advantage is speed uh, but it has nothing like the performance of Alpha 42. Amazing. And that is all, the, ultimately, the marriage of artificial intelligence with evolutionary information.
But then we get to the next level, in my view, to the level of understanding the language of life, the language of proteins, the language that is, or the grammar that is put into the embeddings, and that's the new breakthrough. That's the revolution that is happening now. AlphaFold 2 is there, and everybody will use it, and we will see what we can use it for. We will be able to use it for many things. Uh, this one is happening now. This happened yesterday. And the world of AI is moving so fast that this makes a difference. Um, clearly, one thing that is very crucial is biology will have a much more difficult time to discover novelty without tapping into the tool of AI or machine learning. So most of the annotations, most of the prediction methods in biology essentially find the same or similar things. They find something ultimately through HBI, through homology-based inference. They find what has essentially been known. For getting novelty, you need AI. But the problem with AI is it's so easy to do nonsense, to do models. Some of these models now have millions of data points or billions of data, free, free parameters. And some people use just the, the sort of rough idea was you have to have 10 times as many samples as you have free parameters. Today, people routinely use methods that have a million times more free parameters than uh, samples, and it completely goes wrong. Uh, some people may not realize that their method is nonsense for 10 years, uh, but this is very difficult to avoid. Uh, nevertheless, there is no novelty without using AI. That's the part that I didn't get to, but it's a very important part for me. Uh, Nobody in society currently is as good at managing bias as computational biologists simply because we have been, it has been our necessity, it has been a necessity for the field of computational biology to learn to handle bias for, for decades now. Um, I'm sorry to you, so I, I gave this two hour and one minute or so talk, uh, and it has sort of seven papers uh, that were published until 2018, uh, but four that were published in 1920 and over 10 papers that were published just last year. So it was an avalanche of things that I presented to you because this field is just increasing so rapidly. So we published a paper uh, in, in, in July 2021 uh, that has now been published, uh, cited 158 times. While that thing was, in fact, when the, the reviewing of that manuscript took almost eight months, in those eight months, it changed. We completely rewrote the paper because the reviewing took so long. Uh, this field is just happening so fast. That is my excuse for this. Um, what's the biggest single organism on Earth? Hi. Any oh. What's the biggest single organism? Nobody? It's a mushroom, uh, honey fungus. Uh, this single organism, it's one organism, of course, how do you know that's a single organism? You know it by, by sequencing, of course. Uh, and so this is very new that we know that. It's over 3,000 years old. It's over nine square kilometers and weighs over 35,000 tons. One organism. Stay curious. Thanks very much. Uh, to to many people, uh, like Loop funding here, uh, and thanks you to you guys, Gigi, uh, Rita, David for organizing this summer school, and thank you everybody for listening. Thank Sorry you. for going over time. Don't worry, it was splendid. I ask people if there are questions. Yes, I have a question. Um, I'm Lorenzo Locash, a student of uh, bioinformatics. And uh, so first, first, thank you for the, the lecture. It was very interesting, especially the last part was very, <laughs> very, very interesting. And uh, I would like to ask um, a question about the commercial applications of the tools uh, that you developed. So, for example, there are companies or startups that uh, use your tools and maybe they, they, I don't know, they write you, they cooperate with you for using those tools that you develop? If that is a question, uh, yes, there are companies, that is correct. Uh, 
Do they write me? No. Uh, all these embeddings that we develop are completely freely available. There's absolutely no reason to write to me. Okay, there are companies that, yes, we are collaborating with companies, but uh, this field is moving so quickly. Uh, my, my entire passion is in getting new language models that can do things that we cannot do at the moment. So to push it a little bit further. And for that, I need NVIDIA. And for that, I need uh, collaboration with companies and supercomputing centers. So there I know exactly what they want to do and what we do. Uh, but company, I do, I'm aware of companies that actually use them. Uh, relatively few of those have approached me or have reached me. And I'm not at ease to tell you what they do. Anyway, Rita is putting up a hand. Yeah, but I can wait for the students. So if students are, students come first, then I will ask a question. Students come first. From the audience. No? Uh, oh. Yes, I also have okay. a question. Very good, Georgi, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for your lecture. It was very interesting. And uh, my question is about uh, the method uh, that uh, was developed uh, for uh, sequence alignment based on embeddings. And um, as we know, the numbers of uh, entries in biomedical database is growing very fast every year and uh, as we know uh, blast uh, works well under this condition uh, because uh, blast uh, use uh, uh, some current version of database uh, during uh, the search uh, so how um, can uh, the algorithm that used embeddings uh, learn a new some new uh, entries from uh, databases and um, learn some new changes in database. Uh, so in other words, uh, is uh, this algorithm an online uh, algorithm? So, uh, I, 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 so thanks. Let, let me begin with, this is a very complex one, Georgie. Let me begin with thanking you for showing yourself on the camera. Uh, that, that's the first one. Then, then I want to sort of make this, this, this big jump here. Uh, MM62, Martin Steiniger. Uh, this is about 60 times faster than Cyblast at the same performance level. So, Cyblast is no longer really the, 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 the state of the art. But now we're getting to the main part of your question. So no, that is not online. And that ultimately is one, when I say this slide is, is painful for me because there's so much energy that went into it. Uh, we are talking millions, literally millions of dollars to train those PLMs. Okay, what I showed you on that slide did cost several million dollars. It's, it's just... I, the red that you see in my face is, is through, the, through the light that is shining on me. Um, but I really feel red. I feel ashamed that, that we did that. There was no other way we could do it. I, I, we, we had to, we had to, but this is not the kind of thing that sits there on online and waits for the new sequence to come in and train again. Um, now, you have to also understand that the um, 2.4 billion Yes, Uniprot grows a lot, but Uniprot has not grown, not even one tenth of that over the last decade. So uh, in order to sort of improve on that BFD version that we have now, how much do we need? We actually don't know. And now we get into other aspects of your question. Uh, so what would happen if we trained smaller database versions? We have some experience, but we have not done that quite through. And ultimately that is because it's so expensive that sort of now doing one non redundant data set, doing it longer, doing it again, is so expensive that we just did not have the opportunity to do it. We're currently doing something where we're trying to sort of get a shortcut, where we are sort of using a large database in a more efficient way, but I cannot tell you what the results are. And even that method will not be the kind of thing that you envision, where it's just sitting there, new sequences come in. What you envision there is a totally cool idea. Uh, but I believe we are a little bit ahead away from that. How well, far in, in the speed of AI development? Is this going to happen in two years from now? Maybe. Maybe. Right? 
in principle. The problem currently is that the algorithms for NLP change so much in half a year that most likely in, uh, if you are at the point of deployment, so at the point where you put any of those, say the T5, and say in, a, in three or five months from now, T5 does exactly what you say. It sits online and waits for new sequences to come in. And then it updates its embeddings, right? Uh, but in five months or six months from now, T5 will no longer be the state of the art. So we will have to replace it and deploy that, take another 12 months. Uh, so when will that fight be over? So we are not at the moment of stability there. What you have in mind, I believe, will come when we have some sort of stability. I believe we are a little bit away from it, but I don't know um, what that means. Sorry for not being able to answer your question. No, no, I understand. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. Thank you. Matteo yeah. Manfredi. Hi. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, it was really inspiring. So uh, I had a question uh, about uh, when you were talking about um, per token and pooling for the embedding of uh, the whole uh, sequence. And I was thinking, is a simple average uh, of all the embeddings of the different residues in a protein uh, such a good way of uh, getting an embedding, a single embedding for the whole protein? Or could we do, could we try to do something maybe a bit more complex like right, using another layer uh, of machine learning to, to compute something that is a bit more complex than just an average. So again, uh, absolutely, Matteo. One example that I showed you, I'm sorry, I this uh, this was such a rapid, when, when I, the moment I got to, so uh, my first half of the talk was very, very slow. And my second half was very, very fast. So the moment we got to the PLM, I presented so many things to you and that I did not give you the details. I talked about location prediction. And I, I said that is the first one where I actually talk about improving method specific. And that's exactly the example. So I talked about the best prediction of subset localization there. And that is a method that does not just do the average over the protein. That does an attention mechanism that essentially, if you want, looks for some local motives. That is an overstatement of the case, uh, but it is some attention mechanism is something that is more local than the entire protein. Uh, there's still some averaging involved. And more generally, I cannot see any, I, can, I, I believe it's impossible that a clever, better ways will not improve. What I showed you is the lower limit. This is what you can do. What I showed you is essentially Mind you, I talked about applications of embeddings. These embeddings are existing since exactly eight months. Uh, and I showed you more than 10 methods that use these embeddings. Uh, that was a rush to get those things through. Uh, the next year will bring 100 more publications that do it way better. Okay, thank you. I'm absolutely sure of that. And if I may, I would like to ask uh, also something else. This is more like, uh, mm, maybe more of a philosophical question, but I would like to have your opinion. Go ahead. So uh, I'm really excited about the fact that uh, with these embeddings, uh, uh, as you also said, uh, we're uh, kind of letting the, the machine learning method or the artificial intelligence method, uh, mm, the, the task of finding uh, what is useful instead of creating uh, uh, ourselves the kind of data that we extract from our data sets. Uh, but do you think we can still uh, maybe combine the two, so um, use the embeddings alongside some other features to improve the, the performance? So I'm, I'm strongly believing that the answer to that question is yes. Having said that, we are, every student who is trying to make my yes come true has failed. That again is sort of part of the evolution. The embeddings that existed two years ago, we called them, for instance, SegVec. Uh, for those, using clever tools or alignment information helped. For Prot T5, it no longer does. And that gets us, and I'm afraid I don't know how to move quickly in this, in this uh, iPad space here. Uh, but the, the part of the story that where I don't, I don't, I don't try to get there. But the part of the story that I wanted to go to is now the embeddings are at the point. So mind you, 
The embeddings only see sequences. They never see any, any annotation. They never see structure. They never see evolution. And for years, I believe, they can absolutely not extract evolutionary information. But now we can predict conservation. So clearly they have extracted evolutionary information. They can predict the effect of saps. And again, that is in fact highly non-trivial because I don't want to get into the details of, of why that is not trivial. Uh, but the later models, in fact, Put so get so much out of the database already. I absolutely believe, Matteo, that ultimately uh, clever features will help, and there will be moments when we have a clever combination of both. But the more these embeddings evolve, the less that be seems to become true. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot. Okay, <clears throat> perhaps it's a little bit too late. But uh, a comment on these embeddings. Uh, right now, the number of sequences in the Uniprot database are over nearly sure. 3 billion. No, no, right? no, those are 200 million. By the way, they are, Uniprot is too small. So with Uniprot, oh, they... we would not get to where we are. Uh, so what we are using is 10 times larger than Uniprot. Uniprot okay, is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. So, but the idea is every, I mean, how often can you foresee the change or the revision of the embeddings? Because, you know, in principle, as you pointed out, what we know is very little. Because if you are reducing whatever we know in the Uniprot database, I would say that 10% of everything is annotating uh, whatever else. Okay, now, problem is, with these embeddings, how frequently do you think that in the future, I don't know, uh, um, I, I even got uh, a sort of uh, uh, questionnaire asking if, it, if we thought that it would have been useful to have embeddings already prepared in Uniprot. So these are around this kind of questionnaires. Problem is, how often do you think that one has to change this embedding following whatever is accumulated in terms of proteomes? It's difficult for me to answer that question, Aida. Um, that gets also back to the other question, can we do it online uh, by the, when sequences come in? So on the one end, I believe the most crucial thing is the next NLP model. Will the next NLP model be so much better that we want that? I do not know the answer to that question, right? Okay. But for our P T5 that we have now, if you bring in f 5 million more sequences, I don't believe it will matter. Okay. Uh, so at this point, the way we use T5, there is no big issue to update that over the next course of the year. Reasons to update would be a completely new NLP, a new model, not T5, but something different. Uh -huh. That makes a difference. Again, we tried at least five different versions that came after T5. Uh, they did not quite do better. So not everything will work, but there will be something maybe. The next point is that the, the way we use embeddings, what we clearly see is they are highly influenced by what is most in the database. If we could change that influence, if we could sort of have new sequences dedicate more to the way the embeddings look. But currently we do not know how to do that. Um, or we, we know how to do that, but we don't do it. We don't know to, how to do it without hurting ourselves. So we, we can do it in a way where for some new sequences we will do better, but for millions of others we will do worse. And that is not a good trade-off. Uh, so to da do that in a, in a way that is only beneficial, we currently don't do. Um, but that would, would change my, my, my answer to your question. So the moment we get to that point where we control this so well that additions could change to the better, then maybe yes, but for the time being, they can easily sit there for a year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction to this new world <laughs> and new ideas.
Yeah. 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 It's, it's a fascinating ride, I can tell you. Yeah, I, mean, I can imagine. It's also a little bit expensive. <laughs> I... <laughs> well, but again, so the, the wonderful aspect of it, uh, so the slide that I showed you about these different types of embedding, that was one slide, right? The number of, of uh, things I said about these embeddings, they are relatively few. Most of what we do now starts from one of these embeddings. And then now you don't, now everything else you do afterwards is cheaper and faster. Hi, David. Hi, David. David? <clears throat> Sorry, I was, I, I was, I've been listening. I've just been uh, but, but, uh, just uh, enjoying your talk. It was very good. I enjoyed it. But to, uh, I guess I have a comment, though, Burkhardt. I guess you probably know, I mean, the AI field is moving away from us rapidly in terms of the scale of the models. So if you look at, if you look at the latest models that are coming out, they're about 135 billion parameters. And uh, I guess, arguably, is it, I mean, uh, this is the kind of thing I, my worry is that there isn't enough biological data to challenge those models. I think they're just, you know, the amount of text on the internet is vastly greater than the number of sequences we probably could ever sequence. No, actually not. You reckon that, not? That actually is not the case. So it depends again, how, how do we translate word to, uh, so current, in our current translation where we have an amino acid as a word, we actually fare way better. So the amount of internet text is less than BFD. So currently, actually, on that set, uh, on that side, uh, biology is the largest data set at the moment. In, not, again, not, not, not in secret space. Not, I, I, text space is much larger than, than the existing. No, because ultimately, again, because we convert by converting a, a word to an amino acid, we win. Uh, it depends a little bit on how you count, right? Uh, but technically, uh, at this point whatever so the I, I guess where you're going is how is this going to work if the models get larger and larger and are we not overfitting more and more That's and right so one the slide that i felt so ashamed for uh is the slide where essentially what we're showing is that the longer you train and i showed on the lower left side so bad performance were the biggest models but the problem is, at this point, we cannot rule out. So it could be because we overtrain with these biggest models. It could be exactly what you suspect, David. But it could also be true that these biggest models, we just don't have enough time to train them enough. <laughs> so if, if you gave us, in, in, instead of, uh, I don't know, let's just throw out a number. If you gave us uh, $50 million, maybe I could show you that those bigger models actually work better. I have currently no evidence for that. All the evidence at this point I have is that these bigger, bigger, bigger models work less well. Uh, and that could be because what you say, or it could be that I didn't train enough. I really do not know the answer to your question. It's inter it'll be interesting to find out, as you say, it's just how do you do it? How do you set up the you know, finances to do those? Uh, yeah, you get it you, very simple. You get the 15 million. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, so easy. You know. I, I, it's, <laughs> May I ask if these models are also... Applied? No, but again, so let, 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 I'm sorry, I have to make that point. It's very important to me. Uh, there is no way in hell that I get 50 million. I, I will not wait. Even if that is an important question, I will not use so much... Ultimately, what we're talking about is energy. We have a planet that has a problem. At this point of the planet, I will not invest into this experiment. That is completely against my... Uh, all my beliefs and everything I'm standing for, we should. So one reason why I'm so in love with these embeddings is because everything we do is so much faster. So again, AF2, Alpha Fold 2 is way better than the tool that I showed you from Constantine. But Constantine's method essentially does with a machine that is under your desk. It predicts the structure for every single protein in human in less than a week. Uh, so it is incredibly and fast. We don't know if it is correct or not, in any case. <laughs> it is, on average, much less correct than AF. AF. Okay, okay, okay. They both make mistakes. Uh, and AF2 is, by the way, very good at showing when it's right and when it's wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, you're, you're, overall, you're right. But, you know, it's, it is very clear that they are remarkable. Doing that AF2, Alpha Fold 2, is doing remarkably well. Uh, fantastic. Good. No. Sorry, David. Uh, 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 sorry, I was just, uh, I was just uh, nodding in agreement with the uh, sort of comments. Uh, so, uh, so, it's interesting. I, I guess one interesting thing about AlphaFold 2 it surprised me. It's, it is actually a really small model. 
And it actually now we find out it didn't take that much training. It's actually quite um, it's actually quite surprising that it was it literally can be trained, admittedly not on a desktop machine, but it can be trained in you know in a week or so on a, on about 128 TPUs, which is quite amazing. Right? Yes, David, but that is again. So we are back to our figure, right? Uh, you have to sort of do the very, very, very big training sets before you know that less is enough, right? You have to go to cars with 10 models uh, before you know that most of the time one model is enough because it converged already. Uh, so there are many things that we have learned over the last year that at cars were not known. So the initial investment, I continue to not be sh so sure how big that model was. <laughs> That's true. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering uh, if uh, this embedding is also, uh, I don't know, done in, uh, in, uh, in DNA sequence analysis or RNA sequence. Yes. So okay. people, are, but... people are doing that. Um, the problem, so ultimately, so the information, so one of the problems with proteins versus NLP is the level of complexity. So if you condense essentially a, a word into, uh, so what's the difference between, so we have 20 amino acids, but English has, I don't know, 50,000 different words, right? So we, we are spanning an entire language with, with 20 different things, while NLP is doing it with 50,000 different things. Now, the moment you go to DNA, this is getting worse. And a factor of five is, is, is tremendous in this example. Um, so yes, they exist for DNA, no, I, I was but just it curious is not that uh, simple. because I know yeah. I don't know too much. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, fantastic. For the students, we will By try way, to there understand is, what is There is one mind. from Michael Heinzinger, who, who is one of the developers, Informa. Thanks, Michael. Is a, uh, uh, there's a link in the chat for one of the DNA uh, Okay, MPs. good. Now, I was just telling to the students that we will try to find an expert <laughs> to teach us everything about embedding and uh, whatever follows up after embedding. So, so get the guy who just wrote this uh, this link. Mm -hmm. No, but uh, we have to but I don't give him teach to the students anyway. how to do embedding uh, <laughs> because they are just at the first year. So I think that we will find a way to teach them how to do it. Okay. Okay, so what else? Other questions, David? <laughs> Other no, comments? No, all oh, very good. I enjoyed it. Uh, so okay, it's, uh, me too. All excellent. Fantastic. So, so I, I finally, I can go and do shopping for the rest of my life. <laughs> 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 okay, so thank you, Burker, for you know thank teaching you. us. Next time, you will uh, uh, focus more on the second part. And uh, we hope to have you here again with us, uh, possibly even in presence. Okay. I would very much like to come. Uh, I want to defend my choice of, of having the first part. I believe if we don't understand what the difference between then and now is, we don't understand the now. And I believe that, uh, I, Matteo asked this question, I still believe that we can <laughs> find a way to sort of combine these two worlds. And I still believe that there may be a future in it, although I said that we have so far not succeeded. But anyway, I'd love to be in Bologna without COVID or with a way, with a, uh, next time we, it will be with a level of COVID that we can manage. That's okay, okay, okay. But perhaps we can have even a couple of lectures instead of just one lecture. I'm game. Okay. <laughs> it's a promise. As okay, long as it's fantastic. Bologna, I'm going to be in it. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you very much for Thank staying you very with much. us. Bye bye. bye bye. Thank you to everybody. Bye bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. Next bye. lecture will be tomorrow morning at 11. Uh, Arne Elofsson. So uh, see you tomorrow morning. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye to everybody. Bye, David. Bye. Bye bye. bye.